Welcome back to a Friday edition of the Cross Border Interview Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown, as always, and today is our last episode of October 2021, and we are pleased, pleased to finally welcome, uh, I can't believe after this long we finally have got him in studio, but Ward 15 counselor for the great city of Calgary, Jeremy Zhao. Jeremy, greatly appreciate it. Actually, Counselor Zhao, thank you so much for doing this. You know, I'm very happy to uh, grace you with my presence today. You know, most people uh, don't get this honor. So I think you should feel very um, uh, honored, I guess, to to have me here. Uh, I think my listeners are excited that we finally were able to get time to sit down with the elusive uh, Ward 15 counselor. But uh, I want to talk about the election. We are two weeks since election day and the week after the election, before we start talking about the swearing in in the next four years, we have to talk about the transition period from the outgoing mayor council to the incoming mayor and council. And the big story that has happened over the last few weeks is the calls for Ward 4 councillor Sean Chu to resign. Um, this was not uh, a shocking announcement that people wanted him to resign, but he stood his ground and he said he was not going to. He was not going to bow to pressure. You were there, as we just talked about in our pre-interview, you were there during the protests the Sunday before the swearing in. Can you take me through that moment when you were at on the ground in front of City Hall uh, with all those people talking about uh, getting Sean Chu to resign or Councillor Chu to resign? Yeah, I think I think one of the big things I, I really want to highlight here is that we're we're looking at this issue from a, a, a moral standpoint, right? We're not disputing the result of the election. You know, Sean Chu won fair and square. He won with a hundred extra votes over DJ Kelly and nobody is disputing that. What we are very concerned about is the type of role model that he uh, is going to be looked at, you know, by not just, you know, his constituents, but children, you know, young people who, you know, want to be involved in the city and, and what that says about the city. You know, the uh, Calgary has been, you know, it just has this, you know, uh, a stigma of being an oil and gas city backwards, right? Obviously not reflective of that when, when we've elected a very progressive council, but we want to, not have this, you know, go on for the next four years. So I think a lot of people, when I was there on Sunday, they wanted to send that message and we exercise our democratic right to be there and to say like, hey, this is probably not appropriate and this needs to be resolved, you know, and I think Sean Chu should do the honorable thing and step down, take a step back, you know, and you know, I'm, I'm diverging here a little bit, but, you know, my, my partner and I were talking about, like, what could he have done better during the press conference that he held, right? He could have talked about support for women. He could have been actually remorseful, you know? He could have been sorry for the uh, actions that he had taken, you know, se uh, 17 years, uh, sorry, sorry, longer than that. But I, I don't think that came out. I don't know who his... PR individuals were, but none of those things were addressed. Even if you wanted to stay on council for, for four years, I think there were some very practical things he could have done to, we, to showcase oh, that, right? Sorry. Yeah. No, no, sorry. I think we just had an audio blip there, so I do apologize for interrupting there. Um, you sort of uh, undercut me there because I was going to say, how do you how do you call for someone to resign? Understandable, like I said, he has done something, and he, I would I, I I keep on hearing the word allegedly done something, but he has openly admitted that he did what he is uh, said to have done. Uh, he went to a house with a sixteen year old girl, and there was a gun involved. I don't want to get into the details because I just, it, it, that's not the story. The story is, should Sean Chu resign? And I want to know, when you were at the protest on Sunday, did you hear from Ward 4 residents? Because this is the optics that I'm looking at. I'm looking at, okay, understandable, the people of Calgary are upset. But what about the people of Ward 4? These are the people who elected him. 
they put their trust in him. They knew the story, but they still went out and voted for him. There's a portion of the population that did not vote. And we can talk about that at a later date if we want to. But the people put their trust in him and they said, we don't, at the end of the day, we don't care. We want you as our next counselor. So were there people of Ward 4 at the protest? I wouldn't say there, there were a significant number, right? If I was being honest, I think a lot of the, the speakers there um, were individuals from, you know, various backgrounds and various organizations or, or kind of represented, you know, um, um, bigger personalities that we would see on TV or on social media. So, you know, you're totally right, right? Ward 4 residents uh, probably didn't come out in the thousands to say Sean Chu needs to step down. And that, that, you know, I respect that. And maybe, maybe, you know, individuals do, um, are able to get over that fact. But the fact that the news story broke just days before the election, you know, from both sides, right? The, the pro side calls it a political assassination. The, the anti chu side calls it a, well, we didn't have all the facts right before the election, right? So, uh, it may be a little bit nuanced. It may be a little bit more complicated than than how I want to portray it, obviously. But I think Sean Chu is one of 15 votes, right? Yes, Ward 4 citizens voted him in, but a lot of his actions, a lot of what he represents, a lot of the votes on council, he gets to dictate in terms of the citywide vote, right? He doesn't just get to uh, vote yeah. on issues that pertain to Ward 4. He gets to vote on the event center. He gets to vote on things like the Green Line. Funding for women assault centers. Yeah. And you know what? I, you know, practical things that you can do as a counselor to say, hey, I have learned from my mistakes. I am willing to learn. I'm not saying we, we don't accept that because I don't like the part where we cancel somebody forever and say they're never, you know, uh, going to ever be able to participate in society. But you have to show those steps as well. And you did not show those concrete practical steps at your press conference. So this is the part of the show where I'm about to put my foot in my mouth and I'm going to probably take some heat for this. What is the purity test for run to run for council now? Because when the news broke about Sean Chu, the first question I had in my mind was, well, actually, the first thing that I thought was, I hope the woman who came forward with this, who went through the legal fight to do this, is okay. It is, we should always be thinking about the victim. My second point that came across my mind is what, what are the other counselors or candidates in their background? What don't we know about these people? Because this election, I, I tried my best to cover the wards, but it wasn't well done. We have people on this council who we don't know. Let's be honest, we don't, they, there's a lot of fresh face, faces. So, is there an appropriate time when we can start asking these new counselors, because they are now sworn in, what's in your past? Do you have a criminal record? And is that an appropriate question to be asking our counselors now? I, I absolutely think so. I mean, I think we've set the bar pretty low over the past couple of weeks. So, I mean, to be able to uh, at least know what your background is, if you, if you have them, say, there's nothing wrong with doing things wrong and making mistakes we're human beings but being able to at least tell us about them and to say that you've corrected those mistakes is something that i think is very important and the reason why i say this i'm an engineer so let's say i built something and it explodes and it kills somebody um and i get uh, reprimanded or whatever and uh and i don't tell my new employer about that you know if they find out later i'm pretty sure i'm out of a job but at least if I had indicated that past and they were able to look past it or they they can see that I've done steps to, you know, um, correct those past mistakes and give me a second chance when it comes to engineering, as an example, I think that's perfectly acceptable. OK, no. And I, and I appreciate that because. I, I don't want to put people through a purity test on what they've done in their past, because like you said, people do make mistakes. I think everyone's made a mistake or two in their life. And if they haven't, they're lying. But I just 
want people to realize that, okay, what John Chu did was horrendous. I, I, I can't, I just want to make sure I keep on saying that for those who are listening to this and going, why are you talking about other issues? Because what he did was horrendous, but we got to ask the questions now. What other things are hiding? Because this was 19 years ago, 20 years ago, however long ago. And we have now a new council and we have to ask the questions now. So that way in 2025, when the next election happens, we aren't in the same position. We got to know up front and hopefully councillors will start being transparent. Will it happen? I don't know. I, I just, my last statement on this and my last question to you this, on this is, I don't think he's going anywhere. He's going to be around for the four years. I, I think he is a uh, level-headed man who's going to try to weather this storm and he is going to be there. Does this make it harder for uh, Mayor Gondek to govern 15, 14 other council, 14 councillors when she started off with a swearing in of not even doing his uh, swearing in ceremony? You know what I'm going to liken it to? I think it's going to either turn into uh, one of two scenarios where uh, obviously in, in 2004, there was the after uh, good scandal and we'll give it a month or two. And, you know, there's some negotiations and agreements involved and he steps down or it's going to be four years where it's kind of like where uh, Ray Jones had to step down for uh, personal reasons and, and we just have kind of a, a ward that's not really represented. It won't be covered by other counselors, but I feel really bad for Ward 4 residents because A, who, which group is going to meet with him, which CA is going to publicly meet with him, right? He, he can't get things done. He's going to be blocked from uh, probably attending committees if they can do a procedural block to do that. He won't be elected as deputy mayor anymore. He probably won't show up publicly to any kind of, you know, your classic ribbon cutting ceremonies and all that. So I think his job is going to be extremely difficult. He's been uh, distanced by both uh, not only his uh, counselors, uh, colleagues, but also the provincial MLAs, federal MPs will distance themselves from him. I mean, what can you get done? I mean, you can stay on for four years, but you're going to be ending up like the Ward 15 counselor who's, a, who's in his PJs right now and just chilling out. Um, let's talk about that swearing in ceremony that happened on Monday. Um, I, I, I won't talk about the counselor, uh, Ward 15 counselor in his PJs. I think that is a audio description in itself and we'll just leave it there. But let's talk about the swearing in ceremony on Monday. Um, it is the first time that a woman was sworn in. It was the first time a black man was sworn in. It was the first time the youngest female counselor was sworn in. We have a very progressive new council. We do have some conservative viewpoints on the council as well, but and some centrists. The thing I heard during the last election was the the politics got involved in actual government. Politics happened because we had opposing voices against Nenshi, Gondek, Farkas, people wanting to run. The first year and a half, two years is a sweet year because that's when people are learning the ropes, but also enjoying the transition period from public life to or private life to public life. How does the next two years after the swearing in look like? Is it kumbaya? Is everyone going to be on the same page? Or are we going to see out of the gate people already getting groups together to sort of do their own thing? It's an interesting question. And I, um, I think I want to remind, I guess, viewers that we may classify counselors as quote unquote progressives or conservatives. But almost, uh, you know, a lot of them are returning from uh, either a previous uh, involvement in council or they're returning incumbents. Almost all of them voted for the 14 new communities in Calgary. I mean, that to me is a pretty much a developer friendly win right there. And I mean, if you want to say Calgary is progressive, then I would see a very a stringent adherence to the uh, Calgary uh, 
transportation plan and the municipal development plan and to uh, actually see growth, you know, 50% of it within an actual city and then the other 50%, I believe, uh, out in the, the burbs or in new communities. So, you know, to, to call it progressive, I would say, is a, is a stretch given that we <laughs> continue to uh, develop out um, even though that would would be very much to the antithesis of the uh, the uh, climate emergency that is going to be announced very soon. I think this council is going to have to, first of all, figure out how to read like a five bajillion page budget before they even can start to snipe at each other. And what we'll see is kind of an uh, evolvement of um, how council plays out, right? Uh, Nenshi's first term, I think council was very collegial, you know, by his third term, you know, he's had a facilitator brought in to try and make things work and to try to have that kumbaya moment. He's had uh, to endorse all of council in, in, in one election. And, you know, it was very more polarizing than it has been previously. So I think there's a lot to be learned when we have so many new councillors coming in. And I don't think we're going to see those fireworks quite yet. I, I, I hope not. I truly hope not, because I think if at the end of the day, I think people should govern and leave the politics to party politics at the provincial or federal level. Um, you, you mentioned it. I've got to I talk about it briefly here because uh, Mayor Gondek's first priority, as she stated after the election, was declaring a climate emergency in the city of uh, Calgary. Um, this did not go over well with the oil and gas sector, as you can imagine. Um, how, how does Mayor Gondek have to navigate doing what is, in her opinion, socially responsible with the needs of the city? Because the oil and gas industry has been a backbone of our society. Let's be honest. It, it, we were built on oil and gas and people still people don't like change. Uh, they may vote for change, but they don't like seeing uh, astronomical change overnight. How does she do this? How do we talk about oil and gas and being in an em environment crisis at the same time? It, Chris, I, I work in the oil and gas industry. And from my perspective, I think there are a number of very progressive leaders, you know, at big oil and gas corporations who have moved on. They've first of all, accepted that climate change does exist. I mean, it's a, yeah, no, I know. It's like a, <laughs> it's like a huge thing here that uh, breaking your podcast <laughs> is going to explode at this revelation here, but oil yeah, and gas industry accepts climate change. This is huge news. Yeah. The, the cross border podcast uh, is number one, uh, overtaking the strategists. <laughs> But only um, hope, only hope, man, <laughs> only hope. Stephen Carter's out. I'm, I'm coming for yeah. him. Now. <laughs> you win some, you lose some, right, Carter? <laughs> so, I mean, back to back to the point about this climate. I think a lot of professionals, oh, uh, they they take this thing and they go, "This is a huge threat to oil and gas." I mean, a lot of us professionals have moved on beyond, you know, these like, oh, like th this is the demise of oil and gas. Like they're, they're always trying to target us. The industry is adapting. The industry is forced to adapt, whether it likes it or not with COVID remote work. Trust me, there are people who still wanted to be in the office during COVID, but they've come around and they're uh, embracing um, remote work, as an example, the threat of AI, nobody really talks about that a lot. I mean, and the fact that a lot of the jobs that were lost are simply not coming back. Like we fail to realize the reality that a lot of the students going to the UFC, for example, they are choosing careers other than oil and gas. A lot of the professionals that were laid off, they are choosing other careers that are more stable. They'd rather take a pay cut than go through this roller coaster ride. A lot of the professionals are, 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 are adapting to go into tech, right? And this is the one of the big things that apparently Calgary is trying to get into is this whole like, oh, we're going to switch to tech and we're going to switch to automation and all that fun stuff. Well, this is what this is what the oil and gas professionals who haven't found a job in a while, that's what they're transitioning to. And they're not coming back. So 
we are an industry that is still embracing a lot of these changes. It's not going to be easy. Nobody said it was going to be easy. Um, it's happening whether we like it or not. And I think it's just been overblown. Is it just the hype? Purpley of social media that people just get on there because let's be honest i hate social media but you have to do it to get the people to listen to your show so i do it but is it just the hyperbole of people just bitching on social media these days i i what worries me most is that a lot of these professionals are are complaining on platforms like linkedin linkedin is supposed to be this you know place where you network you're trying to build your um oh, work connections and all that but people are turning it into a facebook style forum where they're just uh your whole resume is on there right it's not just like your like cat photos and your your resume of your uh uh, a Pokemon cards here. This is your actual uh, resume, and you are publicly stating things that may hurt you in the long term when it comes to job prospects. So I, I would really caution, you know, uh, especially those within the oil and gas industry, to really, um, you can you can be vocal, but it, take a very measured approach as to how you approach it, or else it will hurt your and you and your reputation, whether you like it or not. Um. We have the next four years uh, to go. Uh, this council is sworn in from 2021 to 2025 when the next election is going to happen. Um, Calgary is in a tough spot right now. We have collapsing oil prices. The oil industry is still rebounding from the boom and bust from the last uh, downturn. We have COVID-19 and the last administration under Mayor Nenshi, um, they approve some big ticket items, the Green Line expansion, the arena deal downtown. Um, does this sort of undercut Mayor Gondek now to say, I, I have big plans for the city, but we're in a financial crunch. We already have our big projects that we have to do for the next four years, which is the Green Line and the event center, which are not going to be done like tomorrow. So let's just put that on the and we have to pay for them for a few years. How does Mayor Gondek move forward when sort of everything is sort of on the table already? I think there are, you know, hidden opportunities. What do we do with those, you know, empty, uh, vacant downtown buildings, right? I, you know, people smarter than I am can can figure it out. What do we do about retaining youth and, and, and talent within the city, within, I guess, the confines of what the city can actually do? What can Gondek, as the mayor now, do to uh, kind of maybe amend those uh, uh, relationships with the provincial government, right? Whether or not we um, are for or against the, the current UCP government, I think it's still very beneficial for the Gondek um, a team to reach out to uh, the current premier and to say, hey, what can we do, you know, uh, together to try and make things better in Calgary, right? What are things that we can, um, in terms of capital uh, financing or infrastructure funding that we can latch on to, to help the city continue to progress further, right? And the relationship with the federal government is also equally important as we uh, try to figure out this whole climate change thing. Um, you mentioned it. I can't, I can't get away without talking about them now because I wasn't going to, but you mentioned provincial government. Uh, during the campaign, can, then candidate Gondek said that she wants to negotiate a better deal for uh, Calgary. Uh, she said that Jason Kenney's doing it with the federal government, so why shouldn't Calgary do it with the provincial government? Um, Jason Kenney is in sort of a tailspin in the polls, and yet again, polls should not be believed until election day, let's be honest there. Um, how how's the relationship going to go between those two? Because I can imagine their first meeting is going to be cordial, but after that, it's probably not going to be very uh, sun, sunshine and roses. Let's be honest. It it's interesting you brought that up, right? Uh, when uh, I remember when Bron Connier ran for his last term, right? The, he had a fight with uh, then Premier Ed Stelmack over funding. Right. And he was able to get his way. I mean, he was able to secure funding, which uh, then eventually rolled into the West LRT at Stelmac looked OK. And, uh, you know, his government, you know, survived uh, 
uh, uh, that, you know, fight with uh, that, that tussle with uh, at Calgary and Edmonton. It always happens. Every single municipal election, they're going to say, hey, we're we're defending insert city here and we're going to go to the uh, insert your premier name here to get more funding because we're standing up for Calgary. And so it, I, I, I honestly don't think it matters whether it's, whether it's right or left. Um, okay. uh, mayors do like to do this to show that they are strong leaders and to be able to honestly secure funding that they otherwise uh, don't have any other means or ways of getting because they are a creature of the province. I, uh, I, if, if anyone is listening to this and they want to run for mayor in 2025, you have just gotten your first free tip, insert mayor's name, insert the city here, insert premier's name here, say you want a better deal. That is our free advice from the Not Strategist podcast. Right now, we have just officially rebranded ourselves as the Not Strategist (laughs) podcast. Um, We are days from the election we are days into this new term as this is airing who are you looking at who what counselors are you looking at besides yourself as the ward 15 counselor for the great city of of ward (laughs) great city of calgary but we have some unique voices on this city council which one and in four years i will have you back on the show to talk about this prediction right now who are going to be the ones that are going to be the standout? And I think we all say they're all going to be standouts in their own way, but there's going to be the Farkas's, the Gondex, the uh, John Carlo Carraz. Who are the ones that you're going to be paying attention to over the next four years? I think the first individual that comes to mind would be Dan McLean in Ward 13, right? He would be the closest We'll say, and I really don't like to put labels on, but I guess I'm putting labels on. You know, he's probably the closest to the more vocal, you know, um, common sense, fiscal conservative uh, t- type of counselor. And it will be very interesting to see what he has to say. You know, he is taking over from an incumbent who's been in that ward for 20 years. And it was time for a change according to the constituents there. So it will be very interesting to hear a uh, a refreshing voice, I guess, that uh, hasn't uh, hasn't changed in, in 20 years. I think another individual would be the uh, successor to uh, Gondex, you know, Ward, uh, Jasmine Mian. I think she ran a very positive campaign. She's an Olympian, right? And she has characterized her, herself as uh, an individual who is willing to collaborate and to listen. And she just brings that very youthful and um, youthful young women, you know, we are going to take over the world and we're going to kick ass kind of attitude. So I'm very, very excited to see uh, Ward 3 as well and to see where that goes. The ones that I'm looking at and I'll throw, I'll actually make my, I'll put them on the record because I've traditionally tried to stay away from making any predictions or any comments on where I should go. The only ones that I made during the election was fluoride and Senate. But I will say this, the two that I'm looking at right now, and this might surprise people, one is um, John Carlo Carra. I think this might be his last term. I think after the last election, his scare of potentially going down defeat, will he go out at doing what he needs to do? And will he go out with his held head held high, uh, trying to get everything accomplished for Ward 9? And the next one I'm looking at is, uh, it's sort of a double edge here, is Pootsman and Chabot. Those are the two, because they're the, they're the comeback kids, right? They're the ones who were on council. They One ran for mayor, one retired, and they're back again. Are they sticking around? Uh, do they have the ability to adapt to the new ways of doing politics, social media, because if you looked at their social media game over the last four years or the last uh, campaign, two months, 10 months, depending on how long they were in the race, do they have what it takes to be the social media savvy? Will they get a good team in place to be social media savvy? So those are the three that I'll be watching closest. I, I don't know because I had the pleasure of uh, chatting with Richard and I can say it he he he's doing it for the right reasons i think they all are but i i suspect that he has to get a good person in that communications role to ensure that he communicates effectively that's my that's my personal opinion 
No, and it's fair, but at the same time, hey, they won without really a social media campaign. So I, I, I always think social media, it has a role, but I don't think it has enough of a role to really trump uh <laughs> You know, like being out there, right, being very engaging one to one, having those uh, networks and having those connections and to be able to win elections really without a without an online presence. Do you think that's what it was or do you think it was name? Because oh, I, yeah, I've been yeah. trying to figure that out. I think it was it was it Ward Six and Ward Ten, which I'm in Ward Ten. I, I I'm represented by Andre Shabbat now. Um, Shabot, uh, was it? his name that won him that race or was it the fact that there were so many other people not in ward six because there was only three other people in ward six but in 10 we had like like the titanic of people running in this election because everyone and their mother seemed to be on the ballot except me so was it that or was it his name oh yeah absolutely when you uh when you have the name recognition uh, no doubt about it off the bat, you have an, uh, an advantage, right? And you were technically an incumbent at one point. Again, another advantage. I mean, study after study, report after report shows that incumbents just have a, a significant lead. So you could, and, and I mean, the caveat though is it's not like Chabot won by a landslide, right? It's not like Richard Putman's run by a landslide. But like you said, name recognition and, you know, name recognition uh, gets tagged a lot with uh, money. So it's, it's usually comes hand in hand. The only person who won in a landslide is Peter DeMond, Ward 14, with over 60% of the vote. So uh, I don't think people win in landslides in municipal elections unless you are running. And he did run opposed, let's be honest, but uh it was hard this election to get your name recognized when the mainstream media, and I hate to use that phrase to quote Donald Trump, but the mainstream media stuck to uh, who was going to win the mayor's race. So let's hope they do better next time, but I'm only a podcaster and tried to do my best to try and get that message out there for those candidates. Chris, for the record, I want the viewers or listeners to know that I won with 100% of the vote so. yes uh graham Stucha, the former ndp mla did not even vote for himself in that election i am shocked i am uh just flabbergasted that he he at the end of the day politicians don't do that usually they came out and they voted for you so congratulations on being semi-acclaimed there it's uh i am i unite all the political spectrums it's uh I uh, like I said like if I guess you can see that I am that angel right if I were to move my head a little bit do look like an angel there you go um Jeremy I want to thank you for this um I know we covered a lot in uh 30 minutes but I, I appreciate you taking time tonight and doing this because uh, uh I, I enjoy talking politics and I enjoy talking politics with a lot of people so I'm glad you're able to come on the show and just talk for a few minutes tonight so thank you so much no, I appreciate it. And, you know, we, we only had praise when we were uh, talking about your podcast on the, the, the Ward Zero one that uh, Darren Esmahan, Esmahan and I host. So uh, props to you for doing all the oh, forums. Geez. Oh, geez. Oh, geez. Do I have to listen to a podcast and just like tune it out when you start talking about my name now? <laughs> oh, God. And I, I know it? what it... Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know what? I know what it's like to... Um, um, host, you know, uh, uh, forums, you know, in every single one, and you're also trying to interview every single candidate. Uh, when I was with Civic Camp, um, obviously it was a different time and place, but we had to organize uh, forums, if if you can believe it, in person and at physical locations, and it's a very grueling task. And so I really commend you for for putting that together because it's a thankless job. Nobody nobody understands the logistics behind it. You know, it's like, it's like simple things like, oh, like, is your facility like accessible for, you know, people with, with, with certain uh, needs? No, I didn't think of that. Sorry. Like, and then you get, and then you get crapped on because you didn't think of that. And you're like, well, it wasn't, I was, didn't intend to, you know, do that, but it was an oversight on my, so like, you know, things like that. I understand the logistics behind it. And I, I think, I think you should be commended for that. So 
thank you for that first off and this is the worst this this is uh this is officially news uh, i'm gonna say this out loud and if you want to send messages to me go right ahead um i did this by myself i think everyone knows that i did the war of the forums by myself i did the interviews by myself i will ask this for the 2025 candidates who are thinking about running <laughs> Please give accurate information to Elections Calgary for your email address, because the email addresses that I find, I will email. Do not come to me after the form and say, well, why didn't you contact me? Well, I did. Just check the email that was on the Elections Calgary website. So I did get hate. I will be honest, but give proper information to people and we will be able to contact each other next time. Oh, that was the worst part about the whole two and a half months. That, well, that plus waiting for surgery, but that's here nor there. <laughs> um, Jeremy, uh, again, thank you so much for doing this. This has uh, been a pleasure and I appreciate you this. And uh, we will have you back on the show for sure sometime later on in the future and potentially uh, the last episode of season whatever before uh, the 2025 municipal elections here in Calgary to see if Dan McLean or Jasmine Maine were the ones to watch in this election, this council term. No, I appreciate it, Chris. Thank you so much for having me.